What's up guys? Today we've got a lateral move in the home theater. I've sold off my Sony 695ES for the JVC NX7 native 4K projector. I've been living the past two years with the Sonys, so I figured it's about time to go back to JVC and see if their new 4K Projo is worth the move. So what we're going to do today is get it unboxed and go over some tech specs. But before we get into it, if it's your first time here on the channel, we cover all things audio and video, like new AV equipment and new movies. So if you're not a subscriber, then tap the subscribe button for new weekly videos. Alright, so the NX7 retails for $9,000 at the time of this video, and this is one of JVC's first lamp-based 4K projectors. Inside the box, we get some documentation, the power cord, the remote control, and here we have some batteries. Weight-wise, this is noticeably heavier than the Sony it's replacing, weighing 43.5 pounds. The Sony was something like 31 pounds. Now this is a big projector, so be sure you have the space if you're thinking of picking one of these up. It's 19 and 3 quarter inches wide, by 9 and a quarter inches high, by 19 and a half inches deep. It's got a 17 element, 15 group, all glass, 65 millimeter diameter high quality lens. So this should give you a crispy image corner to corner. Aesthetically, it's got a high quality build. It's all matte black with a somewhat sandy texture. This will make sure you don't have any reflections coming off the projector's casing. Up front, you'll find the IR sensor with exhaust vents on each corner. Around back, you'll find the connections for the 3D emitter, two HDMI ins with support for 4K60 material, an RS-232 in, a USB input, Ethernet in, and a trigger output. There's buttons for power, menu, directional keys, and another IR sensor. If you need to clean or replace the filter, you can do that back here as well. On the left side, you'll find the door to replace the lamp, which is underneath that sticker. So the NX7 falls in the middle of JVC's 4K lamp-based projectors. It's got a 1900 lumen rating, so it should be a little brighter than my old Sony. The contrast ratio is spec at native 80,000 to 1, and dynamic contrast is 800,000 to 1 due to the dynamic iris. Resolution is 4096 by 2160, which is DCI 4K, so it's a little higher than UHD 4K, which is 3840 by 2160. Lamp life is rated at 4500 hours on low, which happens to be 1500 lower than the Sony's 6000 hours. For setup, this will be mounted on my ceiling and it'll be paired up with a Zipidi 4K media player and a Panasonic UB9000 4K Blu-ray player. I'll be using a Stuart film screen with a gain of 1.0. Now let's take a look at some of the settings and how the image looks. Under picture modes, you'll have six presets and six user adjustable presets. There's film, HLG, HDR10, frame adapt HDR, cinema, and natural. For lamp power, there's low, which will give you 4,500 hours of lamp life and 3,500 on high. You should be able to tell the difference here. Everything we'll be looking at in this video will be set to low from here on out. For aperture, there's three settings, auto one, two, and manual. Keep your eyes on the image and you should be able to see the iris working when it comes out of an all black screen. Keep your eyes on how the blue sky changes color here. If we change it to manual, then there's no shift in color. Now let's play him at normal speed and in slow motion. If you do keep it on manual, you can close down the aperture to enhance blacks, or you can keep it wide open to get the max brightness. And here you can rename the preset if you want. 
For color profiles, there's a bunch of presets here as well. Four custom presets, and the last two are designed for the Panasonic 4K Blu-ray players. If you've got the proper calibration tools, you can find the color management settings here. For color temp, there's presets here as well, and two custom presets. And here we have a few gamma curves and a few customizable presets. Under MPC level, you can use these settings to add some sharpness by adjusting Enhance smooth out any banding with smoothing, and there's noise reduction as the last option. I keep these at zero, but these could help out if you're watching low quality content. Under motion control is the low latency settings if you plan on playing video games. I believe it's got a measured response of 40 milliseconds. Good for casual gamers, but not if you're real competitive. Motion enhance will give you the soap opera effect if you like that look. You have low and high options. And for clear motion drive, you can choose between low and high to get rid of judder. I actually find putting this on low for 3D content looks really good. This is Ready Player One on 4K Blu-ray if you're wondering. And here you have some basic picture controls. Here you have the input signal level. Color space, and here you'll find the 3D controls. You can adjust the parallax and crosstalk cancellations. If you do want to use 3D on the projector, you can use the PK-EM2 transmitter, which is 100 bucks extra. I'm using it with the Xpan 105 glasses, and it works perfectly fine. I didn't see any crosstalk, and it's got great depth. And if you want to keep the iris all the way open, it throws a really bright 3D image. If I was going to compare it to the Sony, I'd say the JVC wins for 3D brightness, but I do feel the Sony has a better three-dimensional effect. It's not by much, but I do feel Sony had more depth overall. The NX7 does support side-by-side -side and top and bottom 3D formats. For HDR setting, there's HDR10, frame adapt, and six user presets. Here we have the HDMI EDID setting with A and B selections. Under installation, you have focus, zoom, and lens shift settings, which are all motorized. If you want, you can lock the settings so nobody changes them. And here you can recenter the image if you want to start fresh. Here's the masking option if you've got some overscan. There's a few anamorphic lens options depending on the type of lens you're using. I use B if I'm watching 16x9 content and C if I'm watching ultra-wide content. I believe the C and D options are for the Panamorph Paladin lenses. Screen Adjust lets you pick the type of screen that's being used with the JVC for optimum calibration setup. There's a chart on their website. Here's the projector install location. And here's the keystone correction. It's not advisable to use this since you'll be cutting away any pixels on screen to fit the image. So try and get the projector lined up perfectly. And this is a few menu settings. If you don't want it to be in the center of the screen, you can move it around here. And for languages, you have a bunch of different options. Here's a few trigger selections. So say if you turn on the projector, you can have it drop down your screen or move your lens into place. Now this is a very important option, the off timer. While shooting this video, I changed this to off. For whatever reason, my Harmony didn't turn the projector off, so when I went to sleep and came back to finish the review, I noticed the projector was still on 20 hours later. So be sure you pick at least one hour for the off timer. And here is the info screen, which will tell you what signal is going into the projector. 
Now besides the LG HU85 Ultra Short Throw Projector, which I also have on hand, the JVCs are the only native 4K projector that has auto tone mapping. It does have an auto tone mapping feature to use with Panasonic players, but that relied on metadata that was on the disc, and not all discs have metadata. With firmware version 3.10, their projector can now analyze the incoming video signal without the need for metadata and auto tone map accordingly. You do have three methods of tone mapping HDR. Static, which is a set curve, frame by frame, which is self-explanatory, and scene by scene, which will look for large variances in the video signal. I'm gonna play a scene from Midway using all three methods. I'll let you decide what looks best. In person, I can see some extra detail in the shadows, and for highlight detail, I can see that there's a little bit more there as well when comparing it to the static method. between frame by frame and scene by scene, I honestly couldn't tell much of a difference at all between the two. Now we're going to take a look at the HDR level control. We'll start it off on auto. If you have a look at the flames, you can see it's really bright and there's a bunch of different dark shades in there. Overall it's bright, but it does look a bit flat. If you manually change it to low, there's definitely more dimension and texture to the fireball. Overall brightness does take a hit though. Medium falls between the two. And high looks the same as auto. So for this particular shot, the JVC is prioritizing the overall brightness. I find keeping it on auto does a good job adjusting most of the time, and other times I do find myself switching between medium and high. Next, let's have a look at the cinema filter option. With it on normal, you're supposed to get about 89% DCI-P3 color. With the cinema filter in place, you should get about 99-100% to P3. It does take a hit in brightness, but you do get deeper colors and better shades, which you can see here. The smoke is more visible here as well. Resolution-wise, the NX7 is razor sharp with high quality video sources like the 4K60 Gemini Man disc. Now I just want to give a shout out to Value Electronics for helping us make this video possible. If you guys want to grab anything that I've mentioned in this video, then please support those folks over there and give them a call or shoot them an email. Just tell them that we sent you. While being a longtime Sony owner, I do feel this was an upgrade. Black levels and contrast are the first thing that jumped out at me. I don't want to knock the Sony and say it's got horrible blacks because it really doesn't. I'd say it's like the Sony was a QLED and the JVC is like an OLED. The QLED TVs have great blacks, but OLEDs, they're on a different level. That's why I say looking at the JVC is like looking at a giant OLED. Those blacks are just so good. The Frame Adapt HDR is another win over Sony. Normally while watching content on the Sony, I'd always find myself adjusting the HDR slider because I'd notice clipping in the highlights, but after you do the adjustments, you'll end up with a dim picture. So I'd always have to find a compromise. With the JVC, it's pretty much done all for you. Spectral highlights pop and glow, 
and you get those deep contrasty blacks with excellent shadow detail. The one positive for the Sony, as I had mentioned earlier, was that I felt 3D performance seemed to have better depth. Motion flow on the Sony, if you like to use that feature, I believed worked better for motion handling as well. As far as fan noise, the JVC whispers along if you have the lamp on low, but it is noticeable when it's on high. Both the Sony and the JVC sounded pretty much the same here in that regard. I feel the auto tone mapping on the JVC makes all the difference here. So in conclusion, if your choices were the NX7 or the 695ES, I think it's a safe bet to go with the JVC and save yourself about a thousand bucks. And it is a brighter projector too. So those are my thoughts on the JVC NX7. Have you guys seen it and how do you think it stacks up against the competition? Leave us a comment and let us know. As always guys, thanks for watching. If you want, you can follow us on social media. And if you want to support the channel and get exclusive content and great discounts on audio and video gear, then stop by our Patreon page. Like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys again in the next one.